Welcome everybody to the Paradise Center for the Arts Virtual Artist Talk with Ron Duffy and Greg Hines. We're super excited to have them in our galleries right now. Um, we had an opening reception April 9th. Um, it was very well attended. Um, Ron did an artist talk for us April 17th. And that was a lot of fun. Was it the 17th, Ron? Yes. Oh my gosh. Uh, okay. No. It, um... Yes, it was the 17th. Okay. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And their shows will be up until May 15th. We also have Hannah Stadler in the Corey Lynn Krieger Memorial Gallery. And we have a spring pop-up shop in the Hy-Vee Gallery. Paradise currently has open hours of Thursday and Friday, noon to five, Saturday, 10 a.m. to two, and if you don't, those hours don't work for you, please let us know and we can um, make an appointment. I prefer a 24 hour notice, but we can get you in to see the galleries when we are closed. And we have more information on our website at paradisecenterforthearts.org. So I don't know if you can see this lovely uh, photo of the Carlander Gallery with Ron's work. Um, Ron also has some books for sale. His pieces are not for sale. The books are for sale that contain all the poems and pieces in his show. And I'm gonna let Ron talk about his show, Brush Back to Life. Take it away, Ron. All right, thank you, Julie. Uh, appreciate being part of the Paradise Center for the Arts uh, uh, artists that get to show their work. Um, I have a question, are, are, am I to start talking about the mystery painting? Yes, you can. Okay, um, there we go, all right. So uh, Julie selected some paintings for me to talk about. I'm glad to talk about all of them. I created a, a series of paintings and eventually poems to go with each painting titled Brush Back to Life. Um, healing while grappling with illness, renewing my spirit while grappling with illness. And uh, this started for me uh, about 10 years ago. I had never painted before, and I followed a heartfelt nudge is what I would call it. Um, it really became a, a powerful faith experience for me to paint, to try painting. 27 years ago, I had experienced uh, Lyme disease didn't know it at the time, and it did affect my life. I do quite well now, but uh, it did change my life, and it brought with it some, uh, you know, the usual set of problems when you face some kind of tough problem in your life, uh, some frustration, some sadness, some resignation, anger, a little bit of loneliness and isolation, all that stuff was mixed in there. And the painting experience, I didn't know it at the time, but I started painting, and I started painting my experience with illness. And I didn't, uh, it took about two years for me to really figure out that's what was happening. It was like putting a puzzle together. Um, and I was, I was surprised as anybody that this was happening. Painting had not been part of my life. And now I thoroughly enjoy painting. I no longer paint about illness. I paint for the joy of painting, but it was a very powerful experience for me. This particular painting here titled Mystery I've exhibited this work around the around the Twin Cities and, and Minnesota, maybe seven times now at various venues. And this was not one of the paintings that was the first part of my uh, show. The paintings often took a while for me to understand what they meant to me. I'd paint them and I really didn't know what I was painting. And after a while, after I would talk to people about you know, I think I'm, I'm painting my experience with illness and it's, it's all intuitive and I feel like I'm being guided in a very positive way. It wasn't scary at all, it was just fun. And at some point in that process, I looked at this painting and, and thought, you know, outer space, cosmos, kind of a little bit mystery and then went bingo, something hit me like, oh my, so much of the experience still is a mystery to me. Why did this happen? I don't particularly care why it happened. I'm glad it happened. It was a healing experience for me, but that's how this painting got its name. And it's why I decided to conclude it in the exhibit. And then I, I uh, was encouraged to write poems for, to go along with the painting. So I'll, I'll read the poem now. This one's titled Mystery. I invite you to a mystery of the human spirit, to witness in painting and poems, a journey into the belly of illness, 
its crevices and dark shadows, exploring unfamiliar terrain of body, mind, and soul. And without knowing why, healing comes, a light like a butterfly resting gently on my shoulder. Don't ask why, butterfly says. Though a story unfolds, after all these years, a mystery it remains. Much I don't understand, much I don't know, and may never know. Don't ask why, butterfly says. Taking the mystery in stride, trusting what needs to be grasped will come to me and you when it's supposed to. Will you accept my invitation? I'd be ready to move to another painting. This is one of my early paintings. And um, I took classes for a year from an artist in the Twin Cities named Dan Mackerman, wonderful fellow, good artist. And he had put a sign on at a local co-op in the uh, Midway District of St. Paul. I used to produce, host and produce a radio program for 10 years. And after the show was over, I'd always go to this co-op to have soup. They have really good soup. And so I was going to this co-op and outside there was a sign that said, uh, painting classes, no experience necessary. And I thought, I'm gonna do that. And that's how I got started. I took three hours of classes once a week. So I created this during one of those three hour periods. I might've even worked on another one. Again, the same story, I brought it home, had it around looking at it. It took quite a while for me to get that uh, Lyme's has a bacteria called a spirochete and it gets inside your cells and it has the amazing ability to camouflage itself and hide. So your, uh, the, good, the good things we have in us that can kill things off can't find it. And then it does its damage. When this, this experience started to come together, like, well, I am gonna paint my experience with illness. I started, I started to look at this differently. And all of a sudden I saw cells and I said, oh, this is, this is uh, when I first had the illness, you gotta remember this is 27 years ago, the medical community didn't know much about Lyme's disease at all. And a lot of the medical community just didn't believe there was such a thing. And so as a consequence, not just me, there are many patients back at that time who in a way suffered from their experience with doctors. You know, you were told, oh, you know, you're just telling me your fatigue is your main issue. That's a sign of depression. You must be depressed. And I, I would say to myself, I think if anybody went through what I'm going through, you, you'd feel kind of bummed out about it but I don't think I'm depressed. I think this is a normal response and I would get angry about that. So what does that have to do with my painting and the poems? It named things for me in a way I hadn't been able to name or accept before. It became real to me and I, I started to go through understanding, yes, this did happen to me and now I, I'm gonna accept it in a way I hadn't accepted it before. And that in and of itself is healing. The whole experience for me has been a healing experience. Uh, given that I don't think we probably have time, I, I, I have a poem with this, but I won't read it. I'll, I'll just move on. This is a painting. Uh, a, a lot of these paintings, uh, I couldn't tell you the order that they happened, but uh, this is towards the end of the exhibit. It's part of the section I call the desire to heal. And um, the paintings... Some paintings might appear more sophisticated than others, but it isn't how they were created. Uh, some of them I'd say you could classify as more therapeutic art. Some might be you know, symbolic art and some I feel are clearly fine art. They've been accepted at the Minnesota State Fair Fine Art Exhibit. But the interesting thing to me is this all just bubbled out in no particular order. And uh, you know, for that I'm, I'm grateful. This painting is titled Soul Essence. And after I understood that I am going through a healing process of naming and living my experience with illness and healing from it, I, you know, meditated on, well, what's this about for me? And it, the, you know, the, an image of the soul part of us kept showing up for me. Here's the poem I wrote with it. It's titled Soul Essence. Inside my body, I see a place, I feel a space where my spirit body finds its home. This is my soul essence. 
In daily life, it's easy to forget this truth. The most essential part of me is not seen with the naked eye, not disturbed by the ups and downs of this thing we call life. When my physical health struggles, I remember I have a place, I have a space where I am vibrant, I am worthy, I feel well. We can move to the next painting. This one's titled Burning Dirty. And this is a, uh, it might be the smallest painting in the entire exhibit. And this, you know, I painted it, didn't know what it meant, sat in my house for anywhere from three months to a year. And I was seeing a medical doctor in Winona at the time for Lyme's. And she wanted to run a particular test on me that measures the, the uh, effectiveness of the mitochondria cells in our body. Uh, I know, I know I, I'm pretty weak on medical knowledge, but I, I know that the mitochondria creates the energy in our body. We want them to be functioning at a high level. And she ran some tests, and I remember the doctor coming back to me and said, Ron, you have, your, your test show is the second lowest test that I've ever seen for the function of the mitochondria. And you wanted a high number and I was having a low number. In a sense, it confirmed that yes, something significant had changed in my system and I was dealing with it. It did tire me out. That's probably the biggest thing I've lived with over 30 years. I run out of energy faster than most people, but, but please hear me now. I do quite well. I've learned to adjust. I've gotten better over the years. I'm, I'm quite, I accept what happened and I'm, I'm a happy guy. Uh, so, uh, the idea that my uh, energy factories weren't burning well was with me, and then I'm reflecting on this painting, and it looks a little bit like, I don't know, maybe the sun, uh, it could be you're close to the sun and it's burning, or it could be the furnace inside a, a coal, uh, remember back in the days in the 50s when we had coal-fired furnaces in many homes, anyway, the green part, I just I thought of it as burning fuel, and yet it's a little bit cloudy, and the concept of uh, burning dirty, like you know, coal, they think they bur burns dirty, not so good for our environment. My personal system was burning dirty coal. That's what came to me. It was an image of what had happened to me. And I, if we have time, we'll, we'll do one more painting, then I'll read the final poem. This painting is titled Good Vibrations. And uh, I remember when I created it at the studio, not when I was taking classes, but after I was done with my, I don't know if it was a year or a year and a half or two years of classes, I joined a studio with some other people and uh, I created it there. Uh, to me, this is my good luck painting. Uh, it's probably, uh, more people call this the favorite painting they have in the exhibit than any other painting. Uh, I named it Good Vibrations in honor of the Beach Boys. I love the salmon color and um, it feels like a happy painting to me. So it's, it's, a, it's a painting that's in the section where I, that I title The Desire to Heal. And um, I'll read the poem that goes with this painting. Good Vibrations. Chronic illness, you were my enemy. Something is changing, good energy. Good vibrations, feeling flow, feeling the sun, seeking understanding, not answers, feeling movement, seeking acceptance, not cure, chronic illness, my teacher, can we be friends now, where to from here, find the good vibrations, let's go, let's go. The last thing I would share is maybe the first one of the first things I shared. This whole experience started as a heartfelt nudge. I just thought this is something I should do. And uh, I felt in good hands. In other words, I feel like I was a co-pilot creating this artwork and art was kind of coming through me as much as I was, I was clearly involved in making the art, but there was something uh, very positive uh, feeling that I was being guided in a very good way. And that's the faith experience part of me. I call it the creative spark that animates the universe. We all, 
We all know our creator by different names and traditions. I'm not particularly too fussy about that. Uh, it was an experience of joy for me. There was no internal critical voice telling me I couldn't do it. I just did it. And the experience has been a healing experience for me. And I'll distinguish that it has not been an experience of curing. I still deal with the symptoms I've dealt with for 27 years, although I'm better and I say <laughs> I deal with them less. Uh, but healing is a much bigger umbrella than curing is. And uh, while I would love to be cured, who wouldn't? Uh, that hasn't happened for me, but I have felt a healing. I've had, I've had a, a greater zest for living and accepting, okay, this happened. I accept it. Now what? What's my job? My job's to find the joy in life. My job's to contribute whoever feel I can to my own betterment and the betterment of the fellow people I come in contact with. And I try to do that. And that's why I like to share it with other people in the hopes that if you've gone through something that's been hard, whether it's a, a trauma, a sadness and, uh, of some kind or other, that there are, there's, as human beings, we have a resource available to us. I call it the heartfelt nudge. I think that's available to everybody. And I really, uh, my hope is everybody finds it when they need it. And with that, I will end. Well, thank you, Ron. And um, I think we're gonna go to Greg next and we can do a questions and answers um, after everybody speaks, if that's okay. Okay. okay wonderful. Um, Greg has his photography in our Vranish boardroom gallery. And the photography is all done with a cell phone. So Greg, can you tell us about that? Okay, thank you, Julie, for having me on here and uh, uh, having my art at the paradise. And um, when I was trying to decide which photos to display, I mean, I've been a commercial photographer for 38 years. And um, in the last 10 years, however, this, this little box, the iPhone, just totally re-inspired my creativity, like unbelievably, because in, in the phone I can, um, it's with me all the time and I just go out and take pictures and then there's, you can process them and edit them and send them out on Facebook or social media, all from wherever you're at. And I just, I thought that was amazing. And um, so I really want to emphasize that all my photos here were done on the iPhone. And um, I mean, I have <laughs> probably tens of thousands of these images and I often will take uh, pictures of textures or items, people. And then when I'm sitting around, say in the waiting room at the dentist, I can just be on my phone and just putting pictures and layers together. And it's kind of like in the old days in the dark room, you'd, you could manipulate things. But I think this is even a, a step further. It's just, it's almost being like a painter where whatever is in your mind, you can put down on a, a piece of paper or in an image. And I, I think that's just so amazing. So um, yeah, I don't know, you can, carry on to the first. I also wanted to have a variety. Uh, for me, it was really hard editing these down. So I, I have with this picture, my wife and I were in Hawaii and I just, the scene here was beautiful. And we took this uh, five mile hike and I had my big camera in a backpack, but I took this cause it was convenient. And it's just, it's pretty much a basic shot. There's a little bit of uh, texture to it and a little bit of tones to it, but it's pretty much basically what I saw. So with, with the phone, you can use it just like, you know, family snapshots and pet shots and cats and everything else, like, you know, Julie. And, but you can also take beautiful landscapes and hang them on your wall and have beautiful art. So that's Oahu, the, the island in Hawaii. You can go to the next one. Now here, this uh, kind of like with Ron said, I, I created this, like one of his paintings. It's like, I didn't know what 
what I was creating. I just, I started with um, the, the, the solid part in the center is a building in downtown Minneapolis. And I, I mirrored it. And then I put a layer uh, with the tree on top of it. I gave the whole, whole scene a texture and tone. And I, I just played around with it. I don't know how long. And then I just kept adding. I'm like, what else does it need? It needs a center focus. So at that time, I was into the those like balls, the the round, actually it, the, the red balls in front of Target is what the balloon is there. And I just played with it and it, it looked like a balloon. So then I took a picture or I had a picture of a person in my archives and I put her in there. And then I took another app and drew the little line for the, the balloon string. And it's, I mean, it's just sort of surrealism. It means nothing. It's just, I, I was being creative and created something and I, I love the tone. It's, <laughs> so you can think about it, whatever you want. You can go to the next one. <clears throat> now this one, this is one of my favorites. I even have one back here. I printed on metal. This was probably 10 years ago. It's one of the first surrealistic pictures I did. And it's the same way. I, I had uh, the Hyatt Regency, in or that's actually the Marriott Hotel in downtown Minneapolis. That's the building floating above the cornfield or the wheat field. The wheat field was down in southern Minnesota, and I just it was beautiful that time of year in the fall, and I took a picture of that. And, and then the other building further back is uh, another hotel, an older hotel in Minneapolis. And for, you know, whatever, one day I just started creating layers. And I love that building with the reflection, the graphic lines, and I just played with it and it created the shadow and you know, it just was weird looking. A lot of, uh, some people, you know, don't like these type of things. They think it's weird and all that, but I I'm, was really influenced early in life by like Salvador Dali and the, the famous surrealist painters. And, but yet I could never quite do that as a photographer. You'd have to have set builders and do all sorts of things. But with the iPhone, you can just create anything with these layers all right there in your phone. So, but with this, which I don't even know the process I did these, especially the reflection and the shadow, but uh, I thought it's almost like this building came out of the cornfields, like the urban parts of our city, you know, came out of the cornfields out in the rural areas. So that's why I put the other building in the background like it's coming up. And then I'm always looking for some sort of focal point, like, or something living like a person or birds or whatever. So I had birds in my archives of layers, which I kind of got on a bird kick for a while. So they're easy to put anywhere. So, <laughs> okay, you can go on. This one, same technique, I just, and actually that centerpiece is the same building, the, I think the Marriott. And I mirrored it and created that pillar there. And I tried to expand some of my techniques with water. So I put the water in there. Um, it's just like Photoshop, you, you pull out and mask off layers and move them around. And this is probably like five or six layers in that photo. And then I put a bird in there, uh, a hawk. But I kind of labeled this the iniquity of man. It kind of reminds me of the way it's touching in the bottom of the picture, which is kind of one of the no-nos, you know, tangents touching. It's anchored at the bottom and then it goes up. It, it almost looks like this grand creation that man has created. It reminds me of like in the Bible where they're creating um, the uh, Tower of Babel. 
it's just like man is trying to be God and they create this big, this big thing. And, and yet man will never be, you know, like that, like God. So anyway, that one kind of had a little bit of a purpose after the fact, but as I'm creating it, it's more just um, for visual, you know, pleasure and, and learning, I guess. Okay, you can go to the next. And this one, that's pretty much a basic picture. Um, that is in Illinois. It's a, a church on the University of Illinois campus, I believe. And I just love the graphic lines, and the real straight, narrow. And, and I also, for whatever reason, well, actually, I love uh, things really symmetrical and centered. And that comes from uh, years ago, I really admired this uh, landscape photographer, David Mensch. He, um, he did a lot of really centered landscapes with rocks right in the center. And it was just for some reason that stuck with me. So, you know, this doesn't have the rule of thirds where the the steeple is off to the side or anything. It's just all really centered. And that I just played with the tone and the, the color and vignette. I just, I think that's beautiful. That's actually one of my favorites as well. And yet it's really simple. So that, uh, I think that's the last one. Yep. So I would just say that, um, <clears throat> I really, uh, some people in the <clears throat> photography community several years ago, a lot of people were saying the phone is not a legitimate um, avenue for photography or you can't use it in, you know, it's not like a real art form. And there's people I've gotten into some uh, iPhone or mobile photography groups worldwide and the creativity with a phone is just astronomical. And I'm talking all done in the phone. The only reason I would put this onto my uh, desktop computer would be for uh, maybe some sizing or something, but all the creativity is done on the phone. And I just, if you stop in the gallery at the paradise and look at my work, just remember that it's all done in the phone and it's just, it's really a fun process. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> so that's that's my art story, in a quick <laughs> quickly. And um, all of Greg's artwork is for sale in the gallery right now. Um, he has sold one piece, and if you are interested in purchasing a piece, let us know. Julie, okay. I also have to say that. Um, Another thing with uh, photography in the digital age is that everyone looks at it on their screen or on their phone. And another thing to see the, the photos in person on the wall, I really believe that art on the wall is the finished point. It's like to see it on the wall, that is it. That's the summation of the art. And I think that's sort of been lost these days. So. Really, in frame, it, yeah. it looks very professional and finished, I think, when it's framed and on the wall. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. We are um, very excited to have your work in the Branish Boardroom Gallery. And again, if you can't make it to the Paradise during open hours, please <laughs> give me a call or an email, and I will um, make sure you can get in and see the work. Um, our phone number is 507 Three three two seven three seven two, or I have the long email of info at paradisecenterforthearts.org, and you can find that on our website too. Um, and I'm, I really mean it. If you want to get in and see this artwork uh, when we're closed, we'll make that happen for you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Um, we have Hannah Stadler in our Coryland Krieger Memorial Gallery. Uh, the Krieger Gallery is for 18 and under. Uh, Hannah Stadler, I believe, is 10 years old. She is a local Faribault student. 
I did find out her mother is an art teacher, so she has a little bit of a leg up. Um, she also is doing digital um, artwork. She's doing digital and a lot of uh, watercolor pens, ink, um, graphite pen. And we have a quote from her. She was not able to be with us today. She had a conflict. But it says, don't try to interpret it in any deep way. I pretty much just thought, uh, thought that looks cool and let's try that. <laughs> so I think that's um, um, very thought provoking for a young artist. And she has uh, quite the collection at the Paradise. So uh, please stop in and see her work. Same thing, um, make an appointment and we'd be glad to uh, get you in to see her work. This oh, uh, pretty mushroom is 100% digital um, artwork on paper. And she has two pieces that are 100% digital. And I'm with um, Greg. I think, you know, there, we've got so many different um, ways to create art now that wasn't popular a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a spring pop-up shop in our front uh, hy gallery. Um, it's um, artists, I think most of them are members of the Paradise or teaching for the Paradise. I have uh, some Raku pieces. Kate Langlaitz, who's doing classes for us, has some paintings. Um, that's her work in the center, um, a landscape with the clouds and a, um, a shoreline, some water landscape. On the right here, we have Tom Willis, a pottery artist uh, who's been showing at the Paradise for a long time who has uh, been helping me with pottery. And here's just a, a variety. Um, we have uh, Lucy Haas, pottery artist on uh, the upper left. She's gonna be teaching for us. Um, she has amazing work. Uh, below her on the bottom left, we have uh, Tammy Ressler, uh, who used to actually be the uh, director of the Paradise at one time. She is really getting into her um, pottery. You can find her work at the Paradise and across the street at Fleur de Lis Gallery. In the middle upper um, photo, we have Bonnie Becker's baskets, um, very affordable, handmade. Um, they are amazing. Um, below that, we have Kim Ann's um, painting. She's teaching for us also with some Kate Lang Lake pottery. Upper right, I don't know where your videos are. Um, Try to move mine. We've got Barbara Pendergrass's watercolors, originals, and she does have some cards. And below her is one of our new artists. This is Jerry Thielen, um, but fuse glass artist. Excited to have all their work um, in the gallery and it is for sale. Um, makes good gifts, very affordable. And of course we would um, love to thank the Minnesota State Arts Board. Uh, these activities are made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Fund. Um, we receive uh, quite a bit of money from the, um, or, or support from the Minnesota State Arts Board and the Southeastern Minnesota Arts Council. We could not um, do this without them. So it looks like we, um, lost our um, guest. And um, Ron or Greg, do you have any questions for each other? I, I'd love to hear when artists um, kind of talk um, about each other's work or influence each other. I, I have something for Ron. So Ron, how, um, as a painter, like you're, Paintings aren't for sale, and I totally respect that because you paint one and that's it. So, do you find it, or have you ever sold one, or have are they totally not for sale? How do you deal with that? Like, if someone really loves one of your pieces, what do you do? Well, you have the books for sale too, though. Um, the paintings in the, this series of work rushed back to life are not for sale. I guess you can never say never, but I, I really don't intend to sell. I, I don't intend to sell them. I, I have one daughter that has clearly let me know that uh, when it's my when it's my time to meet the great maker, she wants good vibrations. Yeah. 
So she'll get that. Um, I, I do uh, continue to paint and I have a website and I do have paintings for sale. It's oh. just this particular exhibit, there is nothing for sale. I see. And uh, I, you know, I kind of, for me, it's, um, it was, it was such a positive experience for me to discover art in the way that I did. It was such a surprise and it, it helped me deal with a difficult time in my life that, uh, uh, you know, I came out of it. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I, what I really want to do is I hope the message that other people can find some connection to it and help them. And for that reason, I'd like to keep the exhibit together. And wherever there's an opportunity to share it, uh, I'd like to do it. That's nice. I I was uh, I have a I don't know if it's a question I just a comment for you and maybe you can respond. You you did answer it when you were talking as a, when I was thinking of it, and it's the uh, image. Um, uh, I think it has the tall building, and then you had the you talked about the balloon and how you put all that together. Do you know yeah. what I'm talking about? Yeah. And so I was going to ask you. You know, how did you create that balloon? And then I saw the line from the balloon down to the human figure. And I, I was going to ask you about, the, you told us how you created all that. And I was, uh, and you also shared that for you personally, I think you related it to surrealist paintings yeah. and said it doesn't have to have meaning per se. Yeah. And the thing that, came to me, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm coming from the other, other end of the spectrum where I create something not knowing what it is. And I wanted to give it meaning, <laughs> particularly about the illness thing. And so I, but I, the thing that came through my mind, and maybe you can comment on it if you're interested is no doubt I could, there's meaning to be created there. If one so chose, I totally respect the artist's choice to say there's so much here it doesn't have to be about anything in particular. What was the question? Um, I'm not sure it was a, so I, I'm not sure I have a question. I, I was, I'd like to hear you talk about, okay. uh, you chose not to look for extra <clears throat> meaning in it. Okay, actually, yeah, those, most of those did not have meaning it, and, I think, and I'm always trying to find meaning in things, whether it's abstract or like I, there's a, a, a mobile artist that I met through one of the groups and we've become friends and he does beautiful, uh, he's a photographer, but he creates, they look like paintings or some, they're just abstract compositions and they have meaning and he titles them as such. And you could almost see from the title um, what he means, but you, you really can't. It, it's just so close. <laughs> so um, I am always trying to look for meaning in things. And the, the pictures you've seen, it's more of a learning process and I will sometimes force a meaning on it, but I don't think that quite works. And um, what I, I guess a next phase in my growth as an artist would be creating something, because I have ideas in my head, but to transfer them into the photo, you know, takes some skill. Like you have to know, you have to know the basics of how your phone works and the apps and all the stuff I've been creating, but to take my ideas, whatever they are and put them into an image is my next step. So maybe Julie, I'll be back in a few years with new stuff that all has a deep meaning or just a meaning. And, and I've done that where I'll just start creating this, surreal image with all these little meanings and it just almost it doesn't make sense to me it's like there's meaning but it's not clear or something so I think it's something as an artist not to get too 
heady or something, but we have to look at what we're trying to convey or say. And Ron, your, your paintings, you say what they mean and you can see it, you feel that. And I think that's clear. But I think when I create some of these things, my story becomes a jumbled mess. I, I, don't, I don't know. So, or, you know, it's like, I know other artists that create these things and, and they say, I had this idea, I kind of sketched it out and then I created it and it becomes very evident what that is. I, so, there was no real answer, I guess. There was no question, but there's no answer either. It's for me, it's sort of a growth process. Um, and it's so fun because as a painter or a, a photographer, we can just create anything. And it's just that's so amazing and so wonderful. <clears throat> So, anything else? It's it's um, unlimited. Anything can anything can be produced, and it's amazing how different people view different things or create different things, and everybody focuses on different things. It's, it's like, just great to see such yeah. a variety. Like the other artist, who's not Hannah, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She said that it doesn't have to have, a, it just looks beautiful. It doesn't have to have this meaning. Whereas I think I'm kind of like you, Ron. I, I think I want more substance in there, but that'll be next time. Mm -hmm. And actually in a good, <laughs> good self-discipline would be trying to make a meaning without just having it go all over the place, kind of like, just rein it in and make one topic or, or whatever and make it clear, I guess. I don't know. So. I think, uh, you know, I, I'm gonna say that, you know, I, I said some of my work is symbolic. Some of it's what I would classify as therapeutic and, you know, some of it's fine art, which I, I mean, fine art in and of itself, you can, beauty can be the meaning of fine art. It's just beautiful. It just, you just like it. It doesn't have to have anything more than that, that it appeals. What, what are the, isn't there something like some philosophers say there's, I don't know about this, but are there three great truths, truth, three things in the universe, truth, beauty, and something else? But I know beauty is one of them and truth is one of them. And that if you're touching on those topics, that's a heck of a lot of meaning. It doesn't, you know, it's just right there. It's true. Well, sometimes think? the meaning is just the surface of the of the canvas. It can be very simple. Yeah. And Ron, I, I agree with you um, on the process of just going out with my phone. It's simple and that is therapeutic because I get out and I see the world, whether it's in a big city or in, in the country, I just, I see the creation like God's creation or man's creation in the city. And it's therapeutic. It just calms me and it makes me a better person. And to be honest, it's like someone said once uh, with some of the abstract stuff, well, what's the meaning behind that? And I'm like, you know, there's no meaning. It's just, it's beautiful as it is, but it's so therapeutic. It makes me a better person because I go out and I just, it's like me and God or, and God's gifted me with this creativity. So I go out and it is just wonderful. And I just take pictures and create and I look and see and listen. And that is just, that's so wonderful to do that. And if, you know, so the creative part, you know, the creative process, I think, is just great for people. My yeah. wife is, my wife says she's not creative, but I think when she goes out and takes walks and do that, you just, you know, it's just, I don't know. See, I got to rein in what I'm saying and make sense. Of it. <laughs> well, I, I have something I'll add to that. I, I have something right on that topic I've thought about for off and on for several years, I've, I've 
over the years, uh, I, I've heard numerous people say, I'm not, they'll say about themselves, oh, I'm not creative. And I usually don't say anything because it doesn't won't be appropriate, but sometimes if I feel it's appropriate, I might say something. And what I do say is, well, maybe not everybody's artistic, but everyone's creative. Yeah. Creativity show, can show up in any, any way in life. You can be a plumber, an accountant, a doctor, a construction worker, a teacher, you name it, you can be creative. And I think that's a universal gift to being humans. You know, artistic is one way to apply creativity and we all have that in lesser or more degrees, but I, I do believe we're all creative. Well said, yes. Me too. <laughs> yes, Julie, you're very creative too. <laughs> and there's one of your inspirations right there. Yep, this is my um, model, Charlie. <laughs> well, hi, Charlie. <laughs> what kind of dog is Charlie? He's a Jack Russell Chihuahua. Oh, wow. Chihuahua. He's, he's a rescue. Oh, oh a mix then? Yep. Yeah. I see the Jack Russell in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, thank you, guys. Um, like I said, this is recorded, so we'll put this on the Paradise Center for the Arts uh, website, uh, social media, and YouTube. Uh, that way, you know, people don't get Facebook. They can still see this. Um, I'll send you the um, link after I'm done um, editing it. And thanks a lot, guys. And again, if anybody wants to come and see the shows and can't make it during open hours, please give us a call or an email and we'll make that happen for you. Um, and Greg, yeah, make sure, uh, make sure you make an appointment to get your family down there to see the show. That'd be wonderful. All right. Thank, Thank you, Julie. You. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Yep. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.